On a late night in February 2000, two men were out hunting in a remote part of County Wicklow. They came upon a car and saw some activity at the back, thinking it was probably a couple, but they would be very wrong. So on February the 11th, 2000, a 26-year-old businesswoman was closing up her shop at 8.15pm. She then walked to her car in the car park nearby and she saw a man uh, rummaging around. But as she opened the door of her car, the man came up behind her and demanded her bag. Um, this would have had £700 in like the takings of the day. And so as far as I know, she, she gave him the bag, but then he punched her. This shocked her and knocked her back into the car. He then grabbed her by the throat and told her to get over to the passenger side. He told her to take off her bra, which he used to tie her hands. He then told her to take off her shoes and he gagged her with a headband. He then drove a short distance and parked her car, pulling her out in her socks and walking across to his own car, a blue Fiat Punto. He put her in the boot of his car and got in and drove turning up the radio so loud that you could not hear her screams or her banging on the boot. He drove eight miles to Beaconstown, which was in County Kildare. Here, he took her from the boot, he undressed her, he undressed himself, and he viciously raped her on the driver's seat. During this ordeal, he managed to tell her that he was married with two kids. He even told her the kids' names. I don't know what must be going through your head because there's always that thing about like if, if if you see an attacker's face, they're less likely to let you go because you can identify them. So imagine how scared she must have been when he's telling her personal details like the name, the names of his kids. And even more weird is why he would be doing such a horrific act and, and thinking about talking about his kids like. While raping her, he kept trying to kiss her on the face and the neck. He then forced her to perform oral sex. After this, he dressed her tied her up again and put her back in the boot. He then drove to the foothills of Wicklow Mountain uh, to an isolated area called Kilranola. Again, he took her out of the boot, untied her, and then he lay down on the seat and said, quote, make love to me. The woman asked if she did, would he let her go? And he said he would. He then went on to rape her another three times. So at this stage, the man began to panic and uh, once again tied her up and this time tied her hands behind her back and pushed her into the boot again. Somehow she managed to free her hands and there was like a can of uh, furniture polish, a spray in the boot. She grabbed this, tried to spray it and it didn't work. So this obviously annoyed him. Um, he then overpowered her, managed to get a plastic bag over her head and began to suffocate her. Uh, she started to go in and out of consciousness, but she, she fought hard. She managed to get one foot out and then both feet out, her bo both her legs out of the boot. And then all of a sudden she was on the ground and he was gone. The two hunters had come upon the attack. And when the attacker saw this, he fled. The woman ran, you know, uh, thinking that these men were with him. She ran and actually while trying to climb over a, a fence got caught in the barbed wire. And um, so the men, you know, obviously cautiously approached her. She was screaming, you know, are you with him? They managed to convince her that no, they weren't and that they were there to help her. They helped free her from the barbed wire and covered her with a coat. And then they took her to Bolton Glass Guard Station. And she basically said, if it, were, if it wasn't for you, he was going to kill me. At 10.35 p.m., Garda Peter Casson and Garda Seamus Murphy watched as two men, Ken Jones and Trevor Moody, walked into the Garda Station with a woman. She was wearing a white top, blue cardigan, black trousers and socks with no shoes. There was blood all over her face. Her nose was fractured. Her hands were tied. Her bra was still tight around her neck and she had a badly skinned knee. The woman was brought into a room and given tea um, while she tried to you know, explain what happened to her. Her sister arrived soon after this. At 12.45 a.m., the woman and her sister, along with three Gardaí, um, drove in an unmarked car to the Rotunda Hospital. The Rotunda Hospital is actually a maternity hospital here in Dublin, but it is also uh, one of our sexual assault treatment units, so SATU. And 
uh, interesting, in interesting yet infuriating fact, I suppose, is that there are only six in the country, um, which are Dublin, Cork, Donegal, Galway, Mullingar, Waterford. So <clears throat> basically, like that, she was assaulted in Wicklow. She has to come to Dublin uh, to be to be seen. The same as as far as I know, like so, let's say you were assaulted in Limerick. I think you have to go to like Galway or somewhere like that because. There's not one for every county. So here at the Rotunda, she had her uh, sexual assault injuries examined and treated. She then had to go to the Matter Hospital to be treated for her facial injuries. After this, she went back to the Garda station and gave a full statement to Garda Aoife Casey. So I'm actually just going to read some of her statement. Um, this is a shortened version. I first, I first noticed him standing opposite my car. He looked distracted and was pacing back and forth. He started towards me and came around the back of the car. It startled me. He said something like, give me the money. He hit me in the face as I tried to get in the car. I struggled and he put his hands on my neck and forced me over to the passenger seat. He got the keys off me and held my head down over the handbrake with his elbow. I couldn't free myself from his grip. He moved the car a short distance and at that stage I thought he would just rob me and then drive me and drive somewhere to let me go. Then he tied my hands with my bra, which he had forced me to take off. My hands were tied really tightly. He asked me to give him the money again. I felt numb with shock and fear. I thought he was going to kill me there. By now, he had covered my mouth with a headband. He told me to take off my boots. I couldn't because my hands were tied, but he took them off. He got out of the car and pulled me out. I thought he was going to leave me there. There was another car there. I was kicking and screaming. He made me walk in front of him with his hand on my back. The next thing I knew, the boot of the other car was open. He caught me by the back of the neck and pushed me in head for first with a lot of force. I kept kicking and screaming. When he put me in the boot, I was facing outwards. I could feel small, flat metal things under me. There was a smell of oil and a football. I could feel something behind my head. Then he started driving the car and playing music really loud. We seemed to be going very fast. I could hear the click of the boot. He pulled me out and pushed me in front of him into the driver's seat and told me to sit down. We were in a field, very mucky like a dirt track. I couldn't see any lights. The driver's seat was pushed back and I could see a baby chair behind me. A baby chair, really like. I felt so numb. I couldn't move. I just hoped it would all end. I feared for my life the whole time. I thought, this is it. He asked me if I was married. I lied and said yes. He told me he was married and had two boys. My hands were blue. The bra was tied so tightly around my wrists they were really hurting me. He loosened the knot and took me out of the car again. He told me to put my clothes back on, but I couldn't. He put on my trousers. This time he tied my hands behind my back with a headband and tied my bra around my mouth. I pleaded with him not to put me in the boot, but he said he had to because I'd start making noise. This time we travelled for about 20 minutes. I knew at that stage I was on country roads. After having pleaded with him, I knew he still wasn't going to bring me home. He opened the boot again. I could hear it click. We were on a dirt track. I felt like the car was on a slope and I thought he was going to drive into a river. I felt I had no chance. He took me from the boot again and sat me in the passenger seat. He lay down and said, make love to me. I said, if I do, will you bring me home? He said he would. I knew deep down he wouldn't. He was trying to make me feel guilty for him as if he were the innocent one. He put me into the boot again and closed it. He told me to face inwards. He put a white plastic bag over my head and I could smell some chemical. I felt lightheaded and couldn't breathe. He kept holding the bag over my mouth and I definitely felt like I was going to die. I managed to get my right foot over the boot of the car and kept struggling until eventually I had two legs over and I could feel my legs on the ground and I was slipping down. He still had the bag over my face, over my face and the pain was just... The next thing I remember, I was crawling on the ground and he was just gone. Meanwhile, Gardaline Horgan and ja uh, Sergeant Jack Kelleher, Kelleher uh, chatted to the two hunters who had brought her in. And they tried to, you know, they talked to him to try to see if they could describe the man. But they could do one better. They could name him. Because when they stumbled upon the attack and the man panicked and, you know, got in his car and sped by them, one turned to the other and said, isn't that Larry Murphy? They told the Gardaí that they knew him because he was a local to Bolton Glass. He had also been in an altercation in a pub in Donard where he basically groped one of 
Moody's friend's sisters and ended up being punched for it. Like, So the hunters took the Gardaí to the area in Kilranala where the attack took place. It was sealed off and at 9.30am uh, the crime scene officers arrived and they managed to find the bag that uh, he used to suffocate her. Larry Murphy was originally from Randallstown in stratford on slaney He was 35, some sources say 36 at the time of the attack, but then later sources um, from when he was released and stuff, if you, from that age, if you date back, it was 35, and most sources are 35, so I'm going with 35, going forward, he could have been 36. He was self-employed as a carpenter and lived in Woodfield in Bolton Glass. He was described as a dedicated family man, a loving husband, and uh, the boy next door type. He had a keen passion for hunting and knew the back roads of Wicklow and surrounding areas very well. After this horrific assault, Larry Murphy uh, drove home. On the way, he stopped to buy a bottle of whiskey, which he drank some of. When he arrived home then, he looked in on his two children sleeping. Then without showering or anything, he got into bed and made love to his heavily pregnant wife. At 8.20am then the following morning, Detective Sergeant Jim Ryan, Garda Horgan, Garda Lawler and Garda Curtis arrived at the home of Larry Murphy. He answered the door and um, the sergeant asked him to identify himself, which he did. They said that they were investigating the abduction and rape of a woman and Larry Murphy put his hands to his head. They then informed him that they were arresting him for this assault. To which he replied, I don't know why it happened, I'm terrible sorry. He asked that he could tell his wife first, which they said he could. So uh, he went into the bedroom to get her out. Obviously she was surprised when she came out and there were Gardy there. But she was obviously even more shocked when uh, Larry Murphy sat her down and said, I raped the girl last night. Before leaving then, Murphy obviously went in and got dressed. And while combing his hair in the mirror, he said to himself, why did I do it? Gardy also removed a legally held rifle. And as they left, uh, Murphy told his wife, I'm sorry. At 8.50am, they arrived back at the station. Um, Murphy was asked to empty his pockets. He pulled a wad of notes out of one and said, that's the girls. And it was £700. He pulled a wad of notes out of the other pocket and said, that's mine. And that was like 440 or something like that. At 8.54am, he asked for his solicitor. His fingerprints were taken, as were his um, hair samples, pubic hair samples, uh, saliva samples and um, scrapings from under his fingernails. The guardie asked where the woman's handbag was and he said in his car. Uh, this was recovered along with her car keys and her underwear. His fingerprint would also then be found on her boot. Um, for the most part he he basically admitted to it, he kind of cooperated um, but at one point he did try to say like that it was consensual and that he never actually tried to kill anybody. So this is some of his statement. I was walking down the path and I seen this girl walking towards me. I had never met the girl in my life. I just flipped. I said to her to give me her to give me your money. She said fuck off. I hit her then. I put her back sitting in the car. I took the bra off her hands. I started talking to her. I told her I had two kids. She asked me their names. I told her X and X. Obviously, they're not going to release the kids' names. I asked her had she any kids. She said she hadn't. She said she would like kids. Yeah, I said, kids are lovely. She says, I will do anything for you. Just leave me home. I said, I will leave you home. I want to leave you home. When I was putting her back in the boot, a jeep came and she started to shout. I panicked and just drove off. I did not try to kill her at any stage. I did not try to put a bag over anyone's head last night. It would be interesting to know at that point, did they tell her, did they say to him, oh, you know, and blah, 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 and she was, suffocated with a bag or did he just volunteer that information himself i went to the stratford arms pub and i bought a bottle of whiskey i drank some of it on the way home when i got home my wife was in the kitchen the children were in bed the bottle of whiskey is still in the car i just went to bed i threw my clothes on the floor i slept on the nip this morning the guards called to my home at about 8 a.m to 8 30 a.m i was dressed in the clothes i wore last night when i went to the door to answer I was kind of expecting the guards. I didn't sleep much last night. Yeah, but it does say that at one point he tries to say that it was consensual. But again, he goes on to even show them on a map where the attacks took place. So he cooperated. At 8pm that night, he was charged with rape, 
and brought to a special sitting of the Bolton Glass District Court. So Bolton Glass at the time had uh, a population of like a thousand, so like word spread pretty quickly. And a woman came forward and said that she did see Lionel Murphy in Carlow Town just before the attack that evening. Another woman came forward and said that in the summer of 1996, she had been in a car with Larry Murphy and that instead of walking or instead of driving her home, he like turned down some isolated way. Suddenly, without saying anything, he put his left arm around my shoulder. I cannot remember exactly, but he may have put his right hand on my leg. I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I asked what was he doing and pushed him back. Suddenly he grabbed me with both hands around the throat and pushed me down towards the door and the front seat of the car. He said nothing. His expression had totally changed on his face and this was a side of him that I had never seen before. I got my hand on the door handle beside me and broke his grip on my neck. I jumped out of the car and he grabbed me again from behind, this time by the upper arms. It doesn't say if anything more kind of happened there. It just says then that after that um, he expressed concern that he would that the woman would tell his wife. It just says that uh, Murphy was never charged for this incident. So again, I don't know if maybe she had gone forward about it before. But to be honest, I can kind of understand why you wouldn't. Because, I don't know. You would hope that you'd be believed, obviously. But maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. Maybe you like that. To be honest, half the time, right, I'm telling you now, women almost feel like embarrassed or ashamed. So the trial for Larry Murphy began in May 2001. He pled guilty to four charges of rape, uh, attempted murder, abduction, assault causing harm and robbery. Uh, apparently he fainted in court one day and the barristers like just stepped over him and two prison officers had to come over and, and help him up. I just thought that was funny. On the 11th of May then, he was sentenced to 15 years for each of the rapes and then subsequently three and four years for the other charges. And these were to run concurrently. Now, here we go again. Because we all know how I feel about the concurrent slash consecutive, the concurrent versus consecutive thing. Um, but I found a video that's about Larry Murphy and I'll, I'll put it up because it's an interesting, it's an interesting take on the whole thing. <clears throat> so um, firstly, so firstly, a journalist called Kevin Myers was basically given out in this video, given out saying, he already received, like the maximum you can receive is 15 years for a rape. So he already received 15 years for one of the rapes. And then because everything was served concurrently, all those other charges, basically every other crime he committed that night doesn't count, basically. So in a sense, it's nearly like go hard or go home. If you've already committed one thing, you might as well do more because you're only going to get charged. You're only going to get punished for one. Um, and then a barrister called Paul Anthony McDermott basically explained. So he said that uh, the, the judge has to give a, a sentence for each crime and then they have to decide if it's concurrent or consecutive. And for the most part, the own, uh, so if a crime is committed while someone is out on bail or while they're already in prison serving time for something else, then the new crime, the time for that, the, the new crime has to be saved after. But for the most part, um, if numerous crimes are committed at the same time, so like that, if, if several rapes are committed to the same person on the same night, uh, they will be run concurrently. But if, like that, if Larry Murphy had raped three women over three days, he would have received more sentences because they could have then decided to do consecutive. So because this poor woman was the only victim, and assaulted several times in in one night, Larry only gets punished basically once. And then we have the lovely thing. Now, I'd actually be interested to know if this is how it works in other prison systems, so in America and stuff. I know you guys get like good time, like time off for good behavior and stuff, but do you guys in whatever country you're in have remission, which is basically every person who receives a sentence here in Ireland so, for example, we'll just say 10 years because it's the simplest maths. Uh, so every prison, every person who gets convicted of a crime and is uh, sentenced to 10 years will automatically only serve three quarters of that. One quarter, 25% is automatically taken off every time. That's just how our system works. You only do three quarters. So every time someone is sentenced to 10 years, 
the maximum they'll actually ever do is seven and a half years. And then time off for good behavior. So we still have the good behavior on top of that. So Larry Murphy was actually released after only serving 10 years and out of 15 years. So even with the time off for remission, which I'm not going to do for the max for 15 years, he also then got time off obviously for good behavior because I think he was a good prisoner in there. But he refused counseling or therapy, like sexual therapy or anything, any treatments, he refused them in Arbor Hill Prison. He also has never shown remorse for what he done. And he was still released early on good behaviour. The victim wrote to the Minister for Justice asking not to release him. And they said their hands were tied. There was a huge media frenzy over Larry Murphy being released. So basically, even before you interest the story, like the name Larry Murphy, there is there is definitely definitely a certain generation upwards anyway, like anybody my age and upwards definitely knows the name Larry Murphy. And when he was released, like he was released 10 years ago, basically, just over 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And I remember he'd been in work and it was a big thing. We would have all been talking about it. All the newspaper articles, all the little mini booklets. I remember there was a mini booklet and stuff we got. Yeah, so it was just mad. Everybody, everybody's talking about him. I'd be interested now. I should actually, should ask a few, few of the young ones that I know and see. I should have said to them. What's that? Like, do you know the name? Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, so it was a huge media frenzy. Tens of thousands were spent on having reporters like sit on this story, sit outside the prison, wait for him, follow him, all this. There was websites set up to like keep track of him. After he was released, it was like hundreds of sightings all over Ireland of him, you know, all this stuff. But uh, so in August 2010, after serving just over 10 years, the 45-year-old Larry Murphy left Arbor Hill Prison and got into an awaiting taxi. The taxi seemed to be going towards uh, the airport and then it actually turned off and he went to Kulak Garda Station and went in and complained about being harassed by all the media. He spent an hour in the Garda Station and then got into another taxi and headed into the city centre and actually like got out of the taxi at O'Connell Street, which would be a busy area, and was able to... like get away from all the media by walking through O'Connell Street. Um, the residents of Bolton Glass actually had a meeting, you know, like a town meeting or whatever, to discuss what they would do, what would happen if he was to come back. Um, on the night of his release, his brother Tom Murphy had to go on TV and basically say, like, we have disowned him. He is not coming to stay with me. He is not coming to stay with like my, our three sisters. Like he basically said that he would have people like knocking up to his house and that his children would be worrying, like wondering like, why are these angry people coming to the door? And that they'd be saying like, uh, is Larry coming here? Is Larry going to be staying here? Where's Larry going? You know, like all this. And that he had to basically go on to live TV to say like, I have nothing to do with him. You know this? And apparently that was, that was as a result of a newspaper printing Tom's house and saying, this is where Larry Murphy will be staying. Like, they're so, they can be so irresponsible. You know what I mean? Like, they can be great sometimes and do, like, investigative journalists are, are great. They can get a lot of important stories uncovered. They can do a lot of damage as well. His brother Tom said that um, the last time he spoke to him was in 2005 after their dad had died. And he said that when he went to see him and told, or whatever they were talking, whatever, that Larry kind of said, you know, like, asked about what's going on in Baldwin Glass and stuff like that. He said that he... Whenever they would ask Larry about the incident, uh, he wouldn't talk about it or else he would just simply say, I flipped. Larry Murphy's wife and children actually moved out of Wicklow. So shortly after being released, Murphy went to live in Spain. And in May 2011, he came back because his passport had been stolen. So he had to get a new one. And so for the few weeks that he was waiting on the new one, uh, he was like staying in hotels and stuff like that. And I believe he stayed in like a safe house um, or halfway house. Safe house, halfway house. And then he left again and actually got the ferry to France to Cherbourg. And then in January or February of 2012, he was spotted living in Amsterdam and working for a logistics company. And the journalist Paul Williams, he actually does a lot of. He's like a big journalist here. He does a lot of the like organized crime gangs and stuff like that. He works on them. Um. So he actually went over and spent three weeks following Larry around. So he basically said that like he lives an anonymous life, keeps to himself. Um, and always seems to be on guard 
But, however, he does hang around with one other convicted sex offender over there who's also Irish that he met in Arbor Hill. And so basically, um, a couple of months after this, obviously when all that was put together, we done midweek, I think, on TV3. It's now Virgin Media, I think. By the time the station was called TV3. And they done like a uh, kind of like a prime time thing about Lang Murphy living in Amsterdam. And then so the Dutch media went berserk because they didn't know any of this. So they actually got in touch with the news station over here and asked to use like the footage, asked for all the information, all of this. So that was all over their news and stuff then. And obviously then people in Amsterdam were really worried, especially people around the area that he was living in. But then like the Dutch police came forward and basically said that they had been made aware by Europol that he was over there, but that they hadn't been given like details. They hadn't been given an address or anything for him. And they said that like after all this, they would go now visit him. But they said he is not suspected of a crime so that they would not be watching him. So here... As part of the regulations or whatever, um, a sex offender is supposed to notify the guardie after release. They're supposed to notify the guardie of a fixed address within seven days. And if they leave the country, they're supposed to notify the guardie here and they're supposed to notify the police in the country that they go to. So as of now, the 56-year-old rapist is uh, living in London as an, Engli as an English, as a master craftsman. And apparently English police are actually keeping an eye on him over there and they're in like touch with the guardie. Uh, Murphy's brother Tom basically said that he had had a normal childhood, played sports, had girlfriends, you know there was nothing unusual about him to kind of predict this happening. He wasn't a loner, he would you know be chatty and talk in crowds and stuff like that. He never came to the attention of the police before the attack, um, although now we obviously know about the other uh, two incidents but again I don't think the police were aware of them. And obviously then that's escalating. Those little things like groping someone, the attack in the car, stuff like that. And then obviously escalating to this. An FBI profiler at the time of his release and stuff looked, you know, looked at the case and stuff like that. And he basically said, uh, there will very likely be a next time because the ferocity of the attack shows cause for concern. And offenders, basically offenders who use excessive harm are needs driven. And so they will do it again. And then... Uh, Detective Alan Bailey, he's retired now. I've spoken about him in some of the other cases, actually. He is part of Operation Trace, which I'm going to get into now in a minute. Um, and he basically says that he, he believes Larry Murphy is capable of killing if he has not done so already. Which brings us on. Okay, so basically, that is the story of Larry Murphy. And as I said, so Larry Murphy is convicted of raping a woman and trying to kill her. That is what he's convicted of. That is what is him um but when i say that people know the name larry murphy for the most part people know the name larry murphy essentially as being as being a killer and if not as being a serial killer uh most certainly that's what i would have had in my head growing up so in the 90s in ireland uh, in kind of the area of like dublin kildare wicklow up to Loud, so kind of like that area, there was um, what is known as the Vanishing Triangle. Now, a lot of people report that six women went missing in those um, few years in the 90s. Really, it's more like eight. There's actually another two women that sometimes aren't counted. So I'll just put up a bit of information here for you guys to see. But <clears throat> now I will say that I remember reading something coming up to the release of Larry Murphy and it basically made it sound like he had killed oh yeah you know, he could that he could have killed all these women because like that he was in this area at this time he worked here he knew this blah 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 but now kind of being older and looking because obviously now i'm really into true crime and i i want to cover more i want to cover these cases i don't know if i've actually said it but i do but i feel like some people i'm not saying not saying like that but like i've seen videos on the vanishing triangle and like it could be an hour video on six or eight women who have gone missing and I just feel like they deserve more than that. They deserve their, they all deserve basically their own video. They all deserve their own investigation. Um, looking back on it, I can tell that like there are three of those six women that are very clearly nothing to do with this. They're basically, they have been harmed by people who know them essentially. Um, but there are three cases, three of the cases that they do believe 
um, Larry Murphy could be connected to and he is certainly a suspect in all of them. And they are Annie McCarrick who went missing in March 1993 in Wicklow, in the Wicklow Mountains in Enniskerry. Essentially that's where they believe um, and if not then in Dublin let's say. So she's in that area. Jojo Dollard went missing in November 1995 in Moon in County Kildare and Deirdre Jacob went missing in July 1998 in Newbridge County Kildare. So these three women are the ones that they kind of, it is basically, he is, a, he is a suspect in it. Legally, I'm not saying he done it. I am saying that police have actually said, the Guardian have actually said that he is a prime suspect for those three, for those three disappearances. Detectives would have interviewed him about these disappearances in Arbor Hill and he just, he refused to cooperate. He wouldn't talk to them. Like it's said that he was working in Newbridge in July 1998, although that is disputed, which I will come to anyway. After his release, a cellmate came forward to say that while they were like making alcohol in their cell, uh, they got talking and that Larry basically said that he did he had killed a woman before, a girl before. And that as he got drunk then, he kind of got looser, let's say, and basically said that he did kill 18-year-old uh, Deirdre Jacob. And how he got her into his car was by luring her over, asking her um, for directions on a map. Um, apparently kind of as he got her into the car things went wrong very quickly and he killed her within minutes of taking her. So it's basically said that he would have been in Deirdre's grandmother's shop. Now again I've heard over the years that he worked, was doing work in the shop. Like that he was doing work in the area, he was all this stuff that he was in the shop the day that Deirdre was in the shop, all this stuff right. Now uh, the family have basically kind of come out to say, because they don't want Larry to be the primary focus because they feel like if he's the only focus, anything else could go missing. You know, other stuff could be forgotten about or go under the radar. Um, but they said that they did find uh, Larry Murphy's name and phone number in like a book or something after the grandmother had died. And it is believed that he had come into the store to like sell some of his toys he made as a carpenter he made like toys wooden toys and he was would have been in the area trying to sell them to shops and stuff like that um the family have said that they have looked into it and that he did he wasn't working in the area when Deirdre went missing it was after he was working in a pub or something but it was after Deirdre had already gone missing so that's kind of where that is and then locals in Moon said that Larry would have been a local in one of the pubs there and this is obviously where Jojo went missing uh, Jojo went missing uh, she had like gotten a bus uh, just shortly she, she, little condensed version she had gotten the bus I think back from Dublin I think she might have already gotten one lift you know hitchhiked to one lift and was and was left in Moon and then obviously needed to get one more lift to home and she was on the payphone I think to her sister and actually then said like oh a car here's a car willing to take me or whatever and so obviously the idea there is that that was Larry's car. Um, obviously then the disappearances of the women, uh, it, they stopped after he was caught. In 2019, uh, Gardy actually went over to London again to speak to him. And once again, he refused. So in a weird event, in August of this year, uh, graffiti on like an old window in Moran's Moran in France I'm probably saying that wrong uh was found that said Larry Murphy serial killer very random and I believe it was like an Irish tourist or something who was going through and seen it and was like what the like what the hell and that's obviously like probably anybody else probably didn't even really get it but he was like what the hell and he took a picture and then it kind of went big uh it's not believed that Larry was in France any time around this time but it's just it's just a really bizarre random thing isn't it in january 2012 the area uh, where the attack happened was searched again as was a hunting lodge but nothing was found in 2018 um deirdre jacobs disappearance was upgraded to a murder and this year in october a search was uh, a search took place in Taggartstown, um, and this was kind of it's kind of on the border of Wicklow Kildare, and um, it's also only fifteen kilometers from Newbridge. And essentially, the search was kind of for for Deirdre, but also then the hope was that maybe 
like you know like Jojo's family and stuff hoped that maybe she might be found or something could be found to kind of link her and um, this happened because of a witness statement from the original event that original event investigation that said that they saw someone uh like dragging something from a boot and apparently this area was searched at the time and nothing was found and so again a fresh appeal just went out or something and they decided to search it again however unfortunately nothing was found uh, I won't say nothing was found. Um, a settlement dating back 500 BC was found, but nothing connecting Larry or any of the missing women were found. So as I said, in 2018, the uh, investigation for Deirdre was upgraded to a murder, which is obviously rare because there's no body, so it's an unusual thing to happen. But in February 2020, the Gardaí sent a file to the DPP for Larry Murphy to be arrested for the murder of Deirdre Jacob. Um, so I don't think it normally takes that long for them to make a decision, but it, there's still been no decision made by the DPP. In fact, they actually brought in a special barrister this year to help look at the, the file and decide if it is possible to go forward and um, arrest him. If it does, the Gardaí are going to seek extradition from the UK. So, I don't know, a few thoughts, I suppose, on the whole thing. As I said, I would have I would have just grown up with with the knowledge, I suppose, or with the assumption that Larry Murphy was a serial killer. That was just the thing. That was just what people said. And that's what that's what people would have reported. It would have been very it would have been written to imply that he was. And in fairness, the guy have said that he's a prime suspect in some of these disappearances. When he done this crime, the attack on this poor woman. So, 35 doing this attack, right? 35 is a bit late, isn't it? Like, they kind of, I don't know, they kind of say things like that it starts earlier. And if we're just saying, for speculation, the other disappearances, um, Annie was the first one, and she was 1993. So he would have been kind of, if he was 35 in 2000, he would have been kind of late 20s. Yeah. Late 20s in 1993. Um, so, I don't know. And some of them some of them date, like, kind of a year apart, the disappearances, and then some of them are two apart. And then, so, Deirdre was 1998, and this woman was 2000. So, it hadn't even, it wouldn't, it was July 98 and February 2000, so it would have been kind of, like, nearly 18 months, I suppose. So, like, could have just been, if he had, legally, if he had, been responsible for any of those other ones and then this was just another one are they like the cooling off periods kind of like 18 months a year two years you know this type of thing um because i would find it hard to believe that this is the first one but then also it was like he used her clothes he didn't he didn't plan he didn't plan it in terms of he didn't bring stuff he didn't bring he didn't he never brought a weapon he didn't bring anything like that but and he used her clothes as kind of like a crime of opportunity. But he also parked his car. Like he parked his car away. And then what was he doing? Like what was he wandering around doing anyway? Doing in Carlo? Like, like, or was that it? Was it kind of just a case of just seeing her? And yeah, do you know I mean? Like that could be it as well. Even if he was responsible for the other ones, it could just be a case of you do just do it sporadically and you just do it spontaneously. You know, he saw that woman. Yeah, no one around. Do it. Do you know what I mean? I do think that he could be responsible for more. Because, and this is my main thing. Larry Murphy was not caught because he made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. He done what he done. He succeeded in getting her into the car. In her own car. He succeeded to then even driving. Like, A15 is not that late. For February. It would have been dark. It would have been dark in February at A15. But it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been, like, dead. There would have been people around. It would have been, I'm guessing, busy. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Car I think Carla Town's small, but I don't think it's that small. Should have, surely there would have even been teenagers and stuff hanging around the streets. But anyway, he got her into his, her car. Then he managed to get over to his car, put her in there without being seen. He then managed to bring her to the first location and, and attack her, rape her. He then managed to get to another location and again, rape her. And... Bear in mind, he raped her another three times like that. This all took time. This wasn't over in seconds. Do you know what I mean? 
And he got through, he got through all of that without being caught. He never made any mistakes. Larry Murphy was caught because of bad luck. Because by chance, those two men were out lamping foxes or whatever they do, where they go out and they shine lights and all this jazz. That is how he was caught. He did not make a mistake. So what's to say that she was the first one? Like, what if he just had good luck the other times? So, that is the story of Larry Murphy. Um, I actually thought it was so weird because when I was, I have obviously my different sources and all that jazz. But when I was looking on YouTube to see if there were, obviously I found the clips and like I said, I'll, sh I'll share the links of the clip from, uh, I don't want to say it was TV3 actually, I don't know, or maybe it was RTV1. I don't know, TV3 is gone now, anyway, Virgin took them over. But, um, so there were little clips like that about stuff, you know, like little news sources. But no one else has ever actually just covered Larry Murphy, as far as I can tell anyway, because when you search it on YouTube, it doesn't come up, which I thought was a bit strange. Now, when you search it, obviously then, because he's probably mentioned in videos, the Vanishing Triangle will come up. And I do want to cover the women of the Vanishing Triangle, but I, I just feel like they deserve to be each individual woman instead of just lumped into this kind of uh, little like nickname it's probably not the word that I'm looking for do you know what I mean but like the different women there's like eight really and they deserve just like any other missing person in Ireland they deserve to have their full story told and like that in a way I see it as family say they don't want just the whole so like sole focus to be on the one man because what if it wasn't him and then it is taken away from anything else so the same for those women so yeah, I've got a lot of work ahead of me. <laughs> um, and there's some other cases. I've, I'm starting to get more case suggestions in, which is really, it's nice to to have. I reached, I reached a thousand subscribers. Sorry, since, this, since the last video, I reached a thousand subscribers. Uh, I think I have like a thousand and like 30 or something like that. Honestly, like I, I remember setting up the, the channel last year and when I got to like 20 subscribers or something, I remember being excited and telling my boyfriend like, I got 20 subscribers. <laughs> And now I have a thousand, which is which is pretty cool. Um, again, thank you to everybody who watches. Thank you to everyone who always comments and stuff like that. There's like there's a good few of you who are always that you use comment on any video. It's really nice. It's it's nice to see the names come up and stuff like that. It's nice. Um, and yeah. So again, if you some of you have given me suggestions already, and I've done some of them, and I am working on other ones. Oh, in a way, it's so it's so daunting in a way because you're like just so many cases. There's so many cases and there's so little time, but um, yeah, just thanks. And again, if you do have cases, send them, send it to me, comment or whatever, or you can email and then um, please let me know what you think of this case. Let me know if you do think that he is responsible for others or what you think, if you think it was just a sole, sole attack and that was it. And obviously we don't think he's attacked anymore. He's been very on the radar for a lot of the time, so I don't know if really he would get the chance to do it again but also as the FBI profiler said if it's a need if it's a needs driven thing he can't really not do it do you know what I mean so I don't know but um yeah let me know what you think and if you heard any noise from the other room uh I apologize I don't think I got it in any other video but if I did sorry um yeah so hopefully he's all soon Thanks, take care.